I am Johnny Massacre. And welcome to the Johnny Massacre Show. This is the Tuesday Night Massacre. On tonight's show, we shall be discussing the ongoing controversy surrounding the 2020 election, as well as the C-word and Jordan B. Peterson, who is back with a book. But before we delve into the political abyss, let's start with some rather light-hearted news about the new second richest man in the world. Who's fucking with me? As you know, Bezos is the richest man in the world. But who is the new number two? Can you guess? Let's have a look. Elon Musk becomes world's second richest man, knocking Bill Gates into third. But will it make him happy, they ask? The world's biggest pissing competition saw developments Tuesday morning after Elon Musk, 49, was crowned the second richest person on earth, nudging Bill Gates into third spot by a rounding error. Bezos, 56, the Amazon founder who is worth 182 billion, is still many tens of billions ahead of Musk, on 127.9 billion. You have to know this stuff. I think the coolest thing about this is that Elon Musk is not woke at all. Amazon banning books and shit, they're pretty woke. And loads of the other rich people are pretty woke and quite controversial. But Elon Musk, he's quite a likable character. And he hung out with Kanye West and shit like that. So I just think Musk is very likable. I think he's likable because he's so clearly flawed, even though he's super rich and such a genius. He kind of, you can relate to him because he's flawed. You know, when he gets up on the stage, he's stuttering and stuff. And, but he's very brave. He still gets up there. And of course, he gets shit done. He's very intelligent. He seems to be immune to Trump derangement syndrome. He speaks out against the coronavirus and the oppression resulting from governments around the world and their policies. And I guess I kind of like the guy. So let's move on to politics. So now I'm sure a lot of you don't want to hear this, but don't shoot the messenger. It seems as if Trump has made moves for a formal and smooth transition of power from himself to Biden. Or has he? So GS administrator Emily Murphy, a Trump appointee, sent a letter to Biden on Monday saying he would have access to federal resources and services to facilitate a presidential transition, according to a copy of this obtained by The Hill. And Trump asked Murphy to begin the transition without conceding his loss. So Trump has not conceded his loss. Obviously, if you're tuning into his Twitter, you can see he's still not accepting the results of the election and he is fighting it tooth and nail. What does this mean? Well, it means, and I am reading from the Biden teleprompter, it means if true, Trump is ordering the government to work with Joe Biden in order to create a smooth transition of power, a formal transition, if you will. Let's have a look at the article so you can read it yourself. Don't take it from me take it from the hill the hill says the general services administration gsa has informed president-elect joe biden and his team that the trump administration is ready to begin the transition process gsa administrator emily murphy a trump appointee sent a letter to biden on monday saying that he would have access to federal resources and services to facilitate a presidential transition according to a copy obtained by the hill now, this gets interesting. Trump, in two tweets, wrote that he had asked his administration to begin the transition, though he did not concede his loss to Biden, and he said he would keep fighting. In the words of Donald Trump himself, via two tweets, I want to thank Emily Murphy at GSA for her steadfast dedication and loyalty to our country. She has been harassed, threatened, and abused, and I do not want to see this happen to her, her family, or employees of GSA. Our case strongly continues. We will keep up the good fight, and I believe we will prevail. Nevertheless, in the best interest of our country, I am recommending that Emily and her team do what needs to be done with regard to initial protocols and have told my team to do the same. So, in spite of that, Trump wants a recount. So, I'll bring you over to rawstory.com. Now, rawstory.com is a dishonest online publication. They do not report factually at all. And they put in a lot of subjective comments. They certainly suffer from TDS. With that said, let's read it and see how far we can get before the Trump derangement syndrome starts to manifest. 
They say, are you listening, Republicans? Trump promotes Randy Quaid tweet demanding a revote of 2020 election. President Donald Trump on Tuesday promoted a tweet from actor Randy Quaid in which he demanded a full revote of the 2020 presidential election. In the tweet, Quaid falsely claimed that Trump had been cheated out of the election. <laughs> okay, so right, okay. So the article, they're saying that it's false that Trump had been cheated out of the election. It's an ongoing process. The president has a constitutional right in the best interest of America and the American people to ask for a recount and the results of that haven't gone to court yet. And so therefore this article cannot say that it's false that Trump has been cheated out of the election because innocent until proven guilty. Anyways, the point is, the reason, why, the reason why I'm reading you this is because I want to show you that despite the fact that Trump has formally started to turn the cogs to transition from himself to Biden, it seems like it's being done for some kind of political reason. You can decide what that is. You can speculate. But Trump's personal stance is he's still fighting this all the way to the end. He believes it's a fraudulent election and he still plans to overturn the results of the election, which seemed to be in the bag for Biden. Now, I actually agree with that. I think there should be a recount. But the problem is, the problem is, this is, if the shoe were on the other foot, let's imagine for a second that Donald Trump seemed to have won the election and then Democrats were asking for a recount. Look in the mirror and ask yourself, would you be down with that? Because I'm pretty sure that the majority of Republicans and conservatives would not. And if we start doing that, if we have another vote, unless there's overwhelming evidence of fraud, even if it blatantly looks like fraud, unless there's overwhelming evidence, I think that is a bit like opening Pandora's box. Then, if you don't get the result you want with the the revote, then how about best of three or best of five? And then no one's going to respect the elections at all. The thing is, the election has already been disrespected. We should never have even gotten to this stage. Trump was saying mail-in ballots were bullshit for ages. Whether it's fraudulent or not, tens of millions, perhaps 50 million plus Americans or more believe the election was false. So the damage has already been done. This should never have happened in the first place. But mail-in ballots are fine, right? That's what the Dems <laughs> that's what the Dems said. In my opinion, we basically just need to throw out all the ballots that arrived after election day, but it's not that simple because especially the democratic controlled counties and ballot counting facilities, they'll say, "No, we got the these these mail-in ballots before the deadline." They weren't wheeled in in the dead of night in wheelbarrows at all. It's so hard to prove all this shit. And unfortunately, the safeguards in place from stopping election fraud are the same things which might be Trump's downfall if he if he can't prove this is fraud in that it stops Republicans from wading in and just doing what they want unimpeded. So this thing is basically a big fucking mess, isn't it? What does this mean? I think it means that nobody has a fucking clue what's going on. It's almost quite reassuring. Even looking at some of the best political commentators, nobody really knows what's going to happen. There's a lack of information. So... Liberals don't know what's going on for sure. They're obviously unsettled. If you go onto Twitter, like with all ideologues, you can guess what they're going to say before they've said it. Trump's totalitarian. Trump is fascistic. He's going to refuse to transition. This is undemocratic. This is the end of democracy, blah, 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 which is ridiculous because it is Trump's constitutional right to contest the election. And if you don't have things like this, it's a slippery slope to tyranny because someone can sneak in there, get something fraudulently, and then basically consolidate their power for eternity. So it's important to have these things. I want these constitutional rights to be respected for both sides. Democrats also have a right to contest elections. They had the same right in 2016, but they didn't because they couldn't, because Trump won fairly and squarely. But the right don't really know what's going on either, it is clear. And I've been reading your comments and I fucking love the comment section here. It's kind of turned into what I wanted it to be, which is just a platform where people can discuss what the fuck is going on because it's so hard to find any honest factual information online. It's always presented and framed with some kind of narrative 
And most of the media is obviously super left wing. Left wing ideology infects everything, sports, video games, movies, music, take your pick. And so it's great that we can have a platform where we can all come and discuss what's going on. And so looking at all your comments and collating them all, I'm still not much closer to what the fuck is going on with this election. But your comments and the commenters can be broken down into four categories. So these are the four types of people I'm noticing commenting in these videos. So firstly are the endless optimists. Now I love these people because they will say things like, Trump's definitely gonna win, no problem. Take it easy, chill, just relax. Trump's got this in the bag, 10D chess. He's had this plan from the start. And while I might not necessarily agree with it, and while I'm not necessarily a conservative myself, I seem to have views from both sides. I don't get this from liberals. Liberals are always doom and gloom. Everything's terrible. And they're so pessimistic and negative. Me being an optimistic, upbeat character, I just love those kind of conservatives who are, they're just confident. It's in the bag. It's all good. The endless optimists. There are quite a lot of you in the comments. And then next you have the rational commenters. So these people are much rarer and they seem to reserve their judgment. They seem to say, let's wait until the evidence comes out. This isn't looking too good, but if it is fraud, then yada, yada, yada. And I would kind of pigeonhole myself into this bracket if I had to. Next, you've got the diehards. Now, these people are all about the mission. You're never conservative enough. It doesn't matter what I say or what I report. If I'm not saying that Trump is God and the other side is scum, then I'm not conservative enough and I'm not a true conservative. But I, I never really was and I see myself as a bit of an anomaly, even though right now conservatives have got it on lock and they seem to be the future of America. And I'm very happy about that. These people will find a counter argument to everything. So some information comes out, it looks good for Trump, then it might be disproved, but then they'll immediately come with some more information to try to prove the argument. I think these people hang out on a lot of forums and they read all the conspiracy theories, but it's, I'm not discrediting these people because a lot of these conspiracy theories often end up being true and they come from these people. So it's just, we're going all the way across the spectrum in the comments. And then finally, we've got the game overers, as I like to call them. Those are the people that have given up all hope. They're saying, we're fucked, Trump has lost, got to move on. And interestingly, there's hardly anyone like this. And I think that reflects on conservative values a lot. They're fighters, you lot never give up. And so what does all this mean? Collating all these comments into one big melting pot, I don't fucking know what's going on. I don't think you really know either, but let's speculate about it in the comments below. If you have any information regarding the forthcoming challenge to the election by Donald Trump, please share it in the comments. I'm just trying to be the voice of reason here. I'm saying that we should wait and see. Time is running out, of course, but I think that you are powerless over this situation. And I'm certainly powerless. I do what I can with this platform. I made this platform to create some kind of forum where people can come and discuss politics and what's going on with the world in a positive way and just try to come to the truth. But even with this show, I can't really make a difference. So why get super, super, super worked up about it if all you can do is just try to spread the word and have an honest, meaningful conversation about it? That's what I'm promoting is to try to be patient if you can. I know it's an emotional time, but just try to be patient, see what happens because you're powerless. And I accept that and accepting that makes this a little bit easier for me to deal with. So I think actually this whole election cycle would be incredibly exciting if so much wasn't at stake. It's kind of like the plot, the script, to an exciting action movie. Now, let me show you a, what's known as a story arc. And looking at this, you will understand how all of the classic movies have been made in the last 50 years. And if you compare the archetypal story arc to the Trump presidency, it basically shows you that the Trump presidency has all the ingredients to be turned into a killer movie. Have a look at this. Here is a story arc. So it starts off with exposition. This is where the story starts. This is where the kind of world is built and the rules are laid down. So the exposition would be things like make America great again, MAGA, build the wall, all these kind of things, crooked Hillary, all of this exposition, setting the stage nicely. Then Trump, he gets into power and then we have what is known as the inciting incident. 
Now, the inciting incident is something that happens to the protagonist, also known as the main character, which means their life will never be the same again. For example, a classic movie trope is where the protagonist's parents are killed. So after that, his life is irrevocably changed. He, he literally can't go back to the way it was before. His parents are gone. His village has been burned down. He has no choice but to reluctantly go on this journey. And that is where the story begins. So what is the inciting incident in Trump's presidency? I think there are many incidents you could say were the inciting incident. But for me, it was the Dems trying to unconstitutionally remove him from office, whether that was Ukraine or Russia or whatever. The Dems tried to get rid of him and they tried to impeach him. And once they did that, there's no going back for Donald Trump. He's forced to face the situation. So, as you can see, the Trump presidency has all the ingredients for an exciting movie. And this is where we are right now in crisis mode. So, as the protagonist wades deeper and deeper into the mire, the action rises. It's been action packed. We've had Antifa, we've had Black Lives Matter, we've had riots, we've had shoot, we've had all kinds of shit. And now we are at the crisis point. And this crisis point is the election potentially fraudulently being stolen from Donald Trump. Now there is another vocabulary or terminology for the crisis, which is much more poetic that I prefer. And it is known as the dark night of the soul. So in the classic story arc, when the protagonist or main character is at their lowest point, this is like Luke Skywalker in Empire Strikes Back when his hand's been cut off by Darth Vader. That is known as the dark night of the soul. And the reason they put this into movie narratives is because at that point you think, there's no way the hero can come back now. So then when he does, it's all the more exciting and all the more impactful. And so what this means is we are going through the dark night of the soul now. Donald Trump has officially started the transition of power over to Joe Biden, but he might have a trick up the sleeve. He might have a lightsaber in his robe. And so if he does come back and takes this election back, it's going to be the most exciting story ever. And as you know, reality is often stranger than fiction. This will be shit that will be the stuff of legend. So actually, I'm kind of looking forward to see where all of this is going to go. Importantly, at the end of the story arc, we have something known as a resolution. So have a look at this. If Trump does come back, which would be this point, the climax, we have the resolution. And the resolution is what the protagonist has learned and how they've developed into something that they weren't before. So hopefully, if Donald Trump does come back, he will have learned something from this situation. He will have evolved and he can impart that onto us in a positive way to take into the future for generations to come. Anyways, here is some news to get your crack and tingling. This is the last part of election news I want to share with you. So the last video was all about voter fraud and the CITOR server and the Dominion voting machine. And it's all fucking confusing. Is it a server? Is it? So Look, what we know is that there's a lot of controversy surrounding the actual technology that's used to facilitate this election. Now, Tim Pool over on Twitter released a cable from Wikipedia that is 14 years old from 2006 regarding the Venezuelan owned, and Venezuelan is a commie country, the Venezuelan owned Smartmatic Corporation, which has been involved in this 2020 American election. Cast your eyes over to this WikiLeaks cable. It says, the Venezuelan owned Smartmatic Corporation is a riddle both in ownership and operation complicated by the fact that its machines have overseen several landslide and contested victories by President Hugo Chavez and his supporters. So, the Smartmatic Corporation that is responsible for the voting technology in America's 2020 election was also used in Venezuela's elections and has overseen several contested landslides before. Make of that what you will. I just wanted to share that with you. So, I fucking love Star Wars, by the way, and I think that Donald Trump, this is my final point on the 2020 election for today and all this fraud stuff. I think Donald Trump might be a little bit like Obi-Wan Kenobi, the character from Star Wars. Now, let me show you what I mean. So cast your eyes over to my screen for one second and watch this scene from Star Wars. Darth Vader is basically Joe Biden, but 
really he's not because we can't credit Joe Biden with being that elegant or charming. But anyways, suspend your disbelief. Darth Vader is Joe Biden and Obi-Wan Kenobi is Donald Trump. And listen to this and I will explain. Your power is a weak old man. You can't win, Darth. If you strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. <laughs> So the point of this is Obi-Wan in Star Wars is a very powerful, inspirational leader and everyone's out to kill him, the dark side, which is basically the Democrats. And he says, if you kill me, my legacy will actually grow to be more powerful than myself when I was alive. And this really happens, right? For example, George Floyd, in a weird inverse way, when he died, his energy and legacy took on a new meaning and purpose for loads of trained Marxists. And look at the movement that it turned into. So if Donald Trump isn't elected with tens of millions of Americans that feel disenfranchised and don't believe the result, perhaps Donald Trump and his energy and his movement will become more powerful than if he had overturned a potentially fraudulent election. Just think about that for a second. Look, I fucking love Star Wars. Any excuse to get it into the show. Actually, a lot of people who subscribe, subscribe because of my reviews of the Star Wars movies, which I'm known for. So if you haven't seen that, make sure you check out my review of Star Wars here. Thank you very much. So moving on, let's quickly go over to the C word. I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's a little bit depressing and I want to remain upbeat. But have a look at this. How's this for Orwellian? Over in the UK's Metro, they say, freedom passes to be given to people who frequently get tested for COVID. Exemptions from self-isolation orders in exchange for frequent testing will be offered to some people as early as next month. Officials have confirmed. Those who qualify for the so-called Freedom Pass won't have to stay at home after coming into close contact with someone infected with COVID-19, provided they keep testing negative. So since when do I need to ask the government for freedom? Do I have to purchase my freedom? Do I have to sell my soul for freedom? What the fuck is this? We are all animals. We're just born into this world and I can't leave my front door unless I get freedom from my shadowy controllers. You've got to be kidding. I find this to be a massive conflict of interest. So the government with your tax money have bought shit loads of the vaccine before it's even proved to work. And if you're forced to take it, in order to be free, then the vaccine developers will get loads of money for that. So the vaccine developers want you to be forced to take their vaccine because then more vaccines will be purchased by the government. This is a massive conflict of interest and it is sketchy as hell. So moving on from the C word. Finally for today, Jordan B. Peterson is back. I'm sure most of the people who watch this podcast do know who Jordan B. Peterson is. For the uninitiated, he is a clinical psychologist and quasi-philosopher and intellectual. And he has inspired a lot of people during the current tumultuous social justice ridden times. The man released a book called 12 Rules for Life, which basically tells you how to get your shit together and lead an honest, good life and how to be satisfied. And unfortunately, Jordan B. Peterson's wife contracted cancer and due to that, he developed an addiction to a, an opioid. And coming off that addiction and that drug, he went into withdrawal symptoms and he nearly died. So he's been off the radar for the past year, but that didn't stop some of the less empathetic online publications from laughing at him and twisting the knife and rubbing the salt in the wound while his wife was dying of cancer and he was recovering from near death. That said, the man is back and he is back with a new book. The book is all about chaos and order. And Jordan B. Peterson's philosophy is inspired by two books, mainly as far as I can see, which is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor E. Frankl, which details a Jewish man's story in the Nazi concentration camps and his survival and also Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn which I often talk about on this show which is a kind of similar experience but in Russia and in both of those books I strongly recommend these because if you read them they probably will change your life what they talk about 
is how there's meaning in suffering, how as opposed to socialist leftist thinkers who want to create this utopia and they actually think you can make this this land of unicorn shit and rainbows where everyone's fucking happy and singing kumbaya wearing rainbow dresses people like Solzhenitsyn and Jordan B. Peterson and Viktor E. Frankl realized that suffering is part of life it is unavoidable if you are not suffering now you certainly will be in the future your best friend will die, your family member will die, or you will get sick and potentially die. So suffering is inevitable. And people who accept that and don't try to fight it often find a good balance in their life and lead rewarding rich lives. And this is what Jordan B. Peterson is all about. So this book is probably going to be incredible because he's been preaching this for so long and the man has just, just suffered hugely in the last year because of his addiction and because of his wife so everything he said literally happened to him and so can you imagine what this book is going to be like it's going to be awesome i think so let's just have a quick look over at jordan b peterson on his youtube channel and see what he's talking about so you know about his book when you can buy it where you can buy it etc because i've got a lot of love for this man he's changed my life a lot um and if you if you if you haven't read his book, or even if you don't know who he is, you've really got to get to know. Here he is, Jordan B. Peterson, the legend. Hi. I'd like to announce my new book, Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life, which I've been working on diligently for the past three years. As of today, the book is available for pre-order in the US, the UK, and Canada. I've linked to some major retailers, including international links for Amazon, in the video's description below. I've also included a link to the Beyond Order page on my website, jordanbpeterson.com, where links to book retailers in different countries will be posted as they become available. Beyond Order will also be published as an e-book and as an audiobook, which I have nearly finished recording. All formats will be released on Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021. I want to provide you with a sense of the book in addition to announcing its existence. So I thought I would read you a section from the overture, the introduction, which describes the book's contents in some detail. Awesome, let's do this. Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life. Why Beyond Order? It is simple in some regard. Order is explored territory. We are in order when the actions we deem appropriate produce the results we aim at. We regard such outcomes positively, indicating as they do, first, that we have moved closer to what we desire, and second, that our theory about how the world works remains acceptably accurate. Nonetheless, all states of order, no matter how secure and comfortable, have their flaws. Our knowledge of how to act in the world remains eternally incomplete, partly because of our profound ignorance of the vast unknown, partly because of our willful blindness, and partly because the world continues in its entropic manner to transform itself unexpectedly. Furthermore, the order we strive to impose on the world can rigidify as a consequence of ill-advised attempts to eradicate from consideration all that is unknown. When such attempts go too far, totalitarianism threatens, driven by the desire to exercise full control where such control is not possible, even in principle. And we've talked about this a lot on the show in regards to coronavirus already and social justice. This means risking a dangerous restriction of all the psychological and social changes necessary to maintain adaptation to the ever-changing world. And so we find ourselves inescapably faced with the need to move beyond order into its opposite, chaos. If order is where what we want makes itself known when we act in accordance with our hard-won wisdom, chaos is where what we do not expect or have remained blind to leaps forward from the potential that surrounds us. The fact that something has occurred many times in the past is no guarantee that it will continue to occur in the same manner. There exists eternally a domain beyond what we know and can predict. Okay, so 
this is getting me really, really hyped for the new Jordan B. Peterson book. What he's saying is something a lot of people don't want to hear or accept, which is in order to grow, in order to feel happy, in order to feel like your life is going somewhere and be satisfied, you have to do things you really don't want to fucking do. You've got to go into that bar. You've got to chat up that girl that looks hot. You can't just fucking stay in the shadows and be a pussy. That's really terrifying for a lot of people. But if you do it, you'll feel really good about yourself. Making that speech, a public speech in front of tens, even a few people can be difficult or hundreds of people or however many people it is. That's terrifying. Nobody wants to do it. But stepping out of order and going into that chaos, after you do it, every breath will feel meaningful to you and like your life is fulfilled. So everything he's talking about there, I find really interesting and I cannot wait to check that out. That is probably going to be awesome. Jordan B. Peterson, Beyond Order. So finally for today, this is where I get demonetized. This is why I play a song that I like and share it with you just because I'm a music producer and this is what I'm all about. So I am into tattoos. I'm thinking about getting some new tattoos and there's some really cool artists out there that I'm looking at. And one of them on their Instagram, they played this shot, a video of their tattoo that they had given to someone and they overlaid some music on it and the music was really really fucking cool it's basically a nerdy anime song with a kind of modern hip-hop beat over it it's called naruto naruto is a really famous anime out here i'm not into all the anime i think it looks really cool but i'm not into it and someone has taken the theme music to this this iconic anime known as naruto which you might know and they've put a hip hop beat on it. So let's have a little listen to that because it sounds it sounds fucking awesome. It's got loads of classical Japanese instrumentation in it and it's just kind of banging. So here we go. Wheel up, come again, selector. Samurai shit. This is hard. Drop it! Get him! I'll reload that shit. If I drop that in the club, I'll be hitting fucking stop on the platter, wheeling that shit up. So I wanted to share that. <laughs> I get so hype about music. I wanted to share that with you because I thought that was really cool. You can listen to the original version of that. So you can kind of see what the producer's done. He's actually done a really good job. This is the original version of the song. Listen to this. So the producer has just taken that little segment from the intro and it's it's really genius. It's very simple, but it fucking works, man. It fucking works. So props to that guy. He's called he's called Flickster and he's kind of underground on Spotify. He's not that well known. F L I X T E R R. So his shtick is he takes kind of cult anime shit and he'll put a beat over it and just kind of bring it up to date. So all of his stuff looks a little bit Japanese and he's taken music from the Wii, vid Wii store, the Nintendo game consoles online store. He's taken the cheesy jazzy music from that and turned it into a beat. So check out Flixter, F-L-I-X-T-E-R-R -R, on Spotify for some interesting fusion music. 
So I just, finally for today, if you made it this far, you're probably quite into the show, so I can kind of tell you what the fuck's going on. So, look, the last video I made about this, the site or server raid in Germany, it's kind of blown up a bit. It's got 30,000 views or whatever. And I got more than a thousand subscribers in 24 hours, which is kind of nuts. And here's the thing, right? I am not really a political commentator, even though this stuff's really important to me because because I just hate social justice and I hate censorship and I love freedom. I'm not really a political commentator and really I'm a music producer, a rapper and a DJ, believe it or not, check out my stuff. So I'm mindful of the fact that people now are tuning in because they want to hear my take on political stuff. And I'm also mindful of the fact that if I'm narcissistic and just give you all my music stuff, a lot of people will unsubscribe. And really I'm all about being real and just being myself. So I'm trying to work out the best way to formulate the show. So really, if I hemorrhage hundreds or thousands of subscribers because I start putting my music on here, even if I gain a few fans for my music, that for me is kind of worth it. So I'm interested to hear what you want to see on the channel, especially if you're a new subscriber. And I tell you what, mate, you better be back for the next episode. Otherwise, I'll be coming around your house. Make sure to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell because that is what all those other cunts tell you to do. Layers.